Hello and welcome back to Precision Perspectives. Paul Shrimp here, a group editor at Meister Media. And uh, welcome uh, to another edition of this where we're having another interesting conversation with a uh, uh, with expert in the precision ag field. Um, and this time a little bit more from the financial perspective. And we'd like to welcome Jonah Culp from Moore and Warner. And uh, welcome Jonah to the to the program. Hi, Paul. Thanks for having me. Delighted to be here. Oh, great. So, uh, so you're right there in the heartland of Illinois. They know they were having challenges planting for a while, and I think things have kind of settled down, or at least they've got a crop in the ground at this point. We have we've done a lot of catch up in the last two or three weeks here, and so that's good. You know, I'm I'm reminded of a conversation I had uh, with uh, with another uh, ag journalist a couple of years ago when we had a wet spring, and the question was, what technology can help? And the answer is sometimes you just need Mother Nature to cooperate. And so we've gotten that in the last few weeks and uh, we're pretty much planted now. Well, that's good. Yeah, it was a, it, I thought it would be an interesting year for data collection if anyone was able to collect data. It's these historic years that are really, you know, the, the, that you want to be able to compare against when you have similar right. kinds of years. But I guess in some cases, it's just almost impossible to collect anything. It is. Well, and I think especially I was having a conversation with an aerial energy company the other day and they're saying, We've been doing our flights, but we're mostly looking at ponds and bare fields and kind of interesting to understand how water moves and, and various drainage issues. But, you know, typically uh, we've got corn that might be six feet high and right now it's uh, probably about a foot or so. Yeah. Yeah. It's It's been interesting to see some of the before and after pictures on Twitter and Facebook that, that people have been showing. It's remarkable. Uh, the, the last year in, in some areas was so good. It was already over people's heads and beyond by this time. And now it's barely, barely out of the ground. It's something That's else. That's right. <laughs> so let's try and talk about more positive things. So, um, okay. well, we're looking at, uh, looking at technology right now. We're, I, I'm interested to know, um, what you're seeing, um, a lot of interest in what's really, um, uh, what's really kind of, uh, I guess from, from the, from the outside perspective, looking in at egg, what's, what's doing particularly well, or what's, what's really of interest. Boy, that's a, a challenging question in this market. I mean, we've had a lift in corn that I think has raised some spirits uh, recently. But in general, I think this year is going to put a bit of a damper on some tech adoption. That said, you know, what's what's of interest? I th think we're doing a better job as an industry of starting to figure out how to integrate more aer aerial imaging um, is a one item. I think the other is really around enterprise management and thinking around financial reporting uh, specifically. At Moore & Warner, we really sit at the intersection of uh, land investing, farm management, and then consulting advisor work on, on ag technology. It's interesting for us to see that those operations who've embraced enterprise level reporting, tracking, uh, financial reporting, management reporting, are positioning themselves to be really premier if we want to call them tenants, but I think of them as premier counterparties and partners to land investors and others in the ag ecosystem, if you will. And so I think as uh, a better appreciation develops for the commercial sophistication needed for production ag of the 21st century, we're seeing some more traction on integrated software solutions. Interesting. So who are the, who are the partners of players that really appreciate that? I mean, when you're looking at when you're looking at that, how does that, how does it make it easier, and what relationships does it kind of uh, improve or make uh, make more effective? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I really think of farmer being counterparty or partner to three different segments. Um, one is the landowner or land investor. One is the ag lender providing working capital or farm mortgage, and then the third is thinking about who in the supply chain. Uh, production agriculture is selling to. So whether that's a food company or an intermediary. And what does that look like from a tech standpoint to the land investor? It's talking about stewardship and financial return um, to the financial institution, the ag lender. That's thinking about the value of collateral, the financial stability of the borrower farmer. And then as we think about the supply chain and uh, consumer packaged good companies, food companies that are increasingly making promises about the sustainability of the supply chain, it's about delivering the data stack around, yes, I was no-till on this farm, or this is my actual application records. And um, that's not a huge portion of Precision Ag today, but I think we're definitely headed in that direction where 
uh, having good farm data becomes ideally a premium or potentially just a requirement for doing business in terms of moving grain down the supply chain. Well, what sorts of data do you um, are, are is really most important to be collecting? I mean, what sorts of um, what sorts of things are uh, are the food companies, the food processors looking for down channel um, that um, that would be important for uh, operations to be considering collecting or making sure that they're getting valid data on? Great question. I think everyone is figuring out because there are no great standards today. And certainly from a premium standpoint, we have the organic market, but that's uh, that's certification, not necessarily a technology stack. But in terms of data collection, I think about collecting data on every pass across the field. It really starts at that point. Um, we're only at the beginning of thinking about carbon reporting. There have been some uh, good articles in the general press in the last few days, and Indigo came out with their announcement around their new carbon sequestration program. But that starts with just collecting data on every pass across the field with every piece of equipment um, and, and thinking about capturing down to application rates and exactly what, what went on and when. And so it starts there, and then we start to get into a conversation of, okay, how does that relate to think questions like nitrogen runoff? How does that relate to questions like your carbon footprint. Um, we're only at the beginning there, but it starts with data on every pass in a single uh, concentrated centralized platform. Interesting. You mentioned Indigo, and I had a chance to visit with them and do um, a quick story and get a sense for what they're doing. And it's, I mean, it's a compelling story and it's very interesting. And I think no one would disagree with the idea that we, we need to kind of decommoditize at least give an option for decommoditizing some of these crops that really aren't generating the kind of revenue for farmers that they actually deserve. Um, how do you feel looking at that and as a path forward? I mean, can you kind of give me some thoughts on on where they're going and what you know whether that's gonna gonna make sense or how long it might take? Yeah, I, I think I have less of a view on indigo specifically and more a view on where the industry overall is headed and. I think the promise of technology is we think about things that are a few years out. So if we think about uh, autonomous, smaller scale farm machinery, I think the promise of technology is being able to, if we want to think about it as break, break the corn soybean cycle that we're in right now, where so much of the infrastructure and equipment is developed for a corn soybean rotation, at least in the core Midwest. As we think about uh, autonomous trucking that allows you to take a, a specialty crop a lot further because you don't have to send a person with it, um, as we think about potentially polycropping systems, right now we're monoculture, um, but with different machinery, cheaper machinery, we could get to a point, and this isn't two or three or four, or even five years out, this is further down the line, but we might get to a point where we have multiple crops in a single single field. Um, and that's a future where it looks very different than the commodity present. And so as we at Moore & Warner really look forward to what we think production ag will look like, I think we'll see a further bifurcation in the market where it will be uh, even larger, uh, in many cases, larger, but really the low cost producer that's using all of the tech to drive the cost of producing a bushel of corn or a bushel of beans to the absolute minimum on one end. And then on the other is using technology really to push uh, specialty ingredients and specialty crops that are needed elsewhere in the, the food and feed supply chain. Um, and so we're pretty optimistic about that. It's just gonna take a while to get there. And I think the challenge today is a lot of the infrastructure isn't there, the market is still being developed. I think people are quick to point to Indigo uh, sometimes and say, it sounds good, but it's not penciling right now. That's the nature of industry disruption, right? Whether it pencils in 10 years is a very different question than whether it's gonna pencil in the next 12 or 18 months. Absolutely. Um, so changing gears a little bit, we heard a lot about, you know, and I heard a lot about uh, when I was at the, in San Francisco at, at Ag Tech Innovation about machine learning and, um, and really the, the, the whole idea of, uh, of, auto, of, of artificial intelligence and what it can do for ag. And it seemed like there's a lot of gravitation toward, you know, that, that terminology and those technologies moving forward. I mean, it, I guess in a near to medium term, how do you see this influencing um, the crop production uh, overall, in terms of data collection, um, this in terms of how we grow crops. Do, do you see uh, anything really practical coming out of those uh, those technologies? And we have seen some things already, but is there anything anything that you're seeing that we should keep an eye an eye out for? 
I, I do. We work with a, a few very large technology companies who can certainly run circles around me from a tech standpoint, um, but that have world-class credentials around AI and machine learning. And as we see the things that they're working on, what I've come to realize is I think we're going to generate a lot more insight, but it's going to be around the basics of the four R's. And that comes from applying AI and machine learning to the farm data and the precision data that we're already collecting. The challenge right now is, as often talked about, is a lot of that data is not centralized, it's not clean, it's not accessible with clear ownership rights. Uh, if you are a Fortune 100 company, it's really important that if you're seeking out massive data sets for AI and machine learning, uh, to apply your AI and machine learning, it's really important that the ownership and licensing around the, that data is clear because you're such a target from a, a liability standpoint. And so one of the challenges that the industry has is even some of the larger data sets, we've not always been clear with producers who actually owns that data and what can it be used for. And so I, I actually think today the the analytical skills are further than the data that's required to put them to use, if that makes sense. We've, we've got to get better at getting the data in the right places. Uh, and we're currently in some conversations that might evolve into public-private partnerships uh, around trying to bring the right amount of data to bear so that we can really apply those AI and, and ML tools. But to answer your question, I think it comes back to better insight around the four R's. Interesting. Yeah, we we've had uh, remember we had initial conversations about big data, and we talked about that you know that that coming in, and there was always that uh, the speaker coming in and saying, well, don't forget the little data, don't forget you know making sure that the data that you start with on the ground is 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 uh, is as good as it can be before you even get to you know putting this together. And we've seen right. a lot of uh, you mean a lot of companies get. Uh, uh, ideas kind of get wrecked by, unfortunately, just bad data coming in and not really being able to reach that conclusion. Is there um, anything you see the industry can do about this? Is it just going to be continue to be kind of a slow evolution, or is is anything kind of moving to the to the forefront that might help solve that? Gosh, that's a I get asked that question a lot, and it's a tough one. Um, I, to a certain extent, there is this open question of whether or not we're gonna collaborate a little bit better in production ag than we have historically. We continue to have a lot, a lot of data to sign. It continues to be, I think, a general framework from a corporate strategy standpoint of we wanna own this customer, we wanna own this data stream, and so sharing and standardization are not as far along as they are in other industries. Um, and I think that's a real barrier. Um, mm -hmm. The, the challenge, and, and actually from a competitive standpoint, if I think about global competition, one of the risks to the US is thinking about how much larger scale operations are in, for, in Brazil and Argentina, for example, where if you're a startup or a tech company and you want clean standardized data, you could talk to a handful of multi hundred thousand acre operators in South America and start to develop some real interesting data sets and the, the amount of work and legwork that would be required to get the equivalent here in the U.S. is an order of magnitude greater. Um, and so this is really a question of do we want to collaborate and break down some of the barriers uh, because the data is going to, it's a rising tide that's going to raise all boats. Um, but I don't think we're seeing the industry collaboration yet that we really need to unlock the potential. I don't know if that answers your question straight on, Paul, but uh, it's going to be a little bit of a challenge here yet. Yes, I, well, I asked it knowing it would be difficult, so I appreciate your <laughs> thoughtful <laughs> answer to that. Um, and with that, I think we have to wrap it up here. I, I, I really appreciate your time today, Jonah. It's been great, great, great talking to you. you. It's, a, it's a pleasure to be with you. Great. That's it for this edition of Precision Egg Perspectives. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.